Amen. Find Matthew chapter 7. Sometimes when we're caught red-handed doing something we shouldn't, maybe eating something we shouldn't, <laughs> we sometimes make it worse by this phrase, I can explain. <laughs> Explaining usually incriminates us further. There are some weird excuses people give for things. These are actual explanations people gave to police officers, quote, after accidents, an invisible ca car came out of nowhere and struck my car and vanished. I had been driving my car for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had the accident. How about this one? I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. These are actual responses to police officers. Two more. The pedestrian had no idea which direction to go, so I ran over him. And here's the last one. The guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. When we try to explain, we often just make it worse. And one day, explanations will be futile. Until then, we have some divine explanations. Now, so much of the Bible is somewhat cryptic, hard to understand, takes a lot of study, and the most learned of all scholars, they themselves cannot understand all of the Word of God. But you know, God has left us some explicitly crystal clear things explanations in his word. Aren't you grateful for that? Amen. That's mercy and grace. And we're dealing with such a passage this morning, and this is where Jesus simply explains some things. Now, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, and it's Matthew chapter 7, and we take up reading in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, these words from the Lord Jesus find themselves in the Sermon on the Mount. And if you think about it, any sermon that's both biblical and practical will take God's eternal spiritual truth and explain it for life application in the here and now. You would expect that would be the case with sermons preached by the greatest preacher of all times. Now, many people don't think of Jesus as a preacher, and yet the Gospels describe him. He came preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent. He is a preacher. He preached the Word of God. And you would expect that the greatest preacher of all times would certainly explain things at times, and he did. And you would certainly expect this of his most famous sermon of all times, the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount has to be somewhat explained at the very beginning because it's been a very, listen to me, church, it's been a very abused passage of Scripture. The words of Jesus, really the most famous words of Jesus, have been twisted, they've been watered down, they've been explained away, and they have been certainly misinterpreted. And I think we need to know how not to approach this sermon, and we'll just uh, take some lines from some uh, historical friendly neighborhood heretics to help us with this. Uh, I won't mention names, but here are just some general views that people have held and held quite wrongly. They say it's a, it's a treatise for nations, but it is not a treatise for socioeconomic policy. Uh, Mr. President, They've just wiped out our whole Pacific fleet. Well, we ought to turn the other cheek, and we just need to let them have our Atlantic fleet as well. I mean, that's preposterous, is it not? 
It's also not simply a picture of how we will interact in the millennial reign of Christ. That is, some people say, well, this is idealism, and this is how it's going to be one day, but right now we can't really live this way. And then here's another one. It's not the naive longings of an enlightened human teacher. Jesus is all human and all God, but you know, Jesus was not enlightened. Did you know that? Jesus was never enlightened, not enlightened at all. He is the light. He is the way, the truth, and the light, and no man comes to the Father but by him. And it's most certainly, now this is the one I want you to hear, okay? It is most certainly not the plan of salvation. If you will do these things, then you will be saved. It is not that. And yet that's really where theological liberals, boys and girls, those are people that still study the Bible, but they really don't believe all the Bible, but they want to get a ch paycheck for studying the Bible and leading people astray. This is really what they say that, hey, this is really the, the rest of things. We don't really know if they happened, but this is the high point of Jesus. This is really all we need to take away from the gospels is Matthew chapters five, six, and seven. And they, that's what they say. Of course, that's false. But what is the Sermon on the Mount? Well, it'll become more clear as we seek to see what Jesus is saying to us here towards the end of Matthew chapter 7. Now, anytime Jesus or the Holy Spirit through a pastor or a friend or a Sunday school teacher or a book or right through the Bible explains spiritual reality, it's met with certain reactions for example, ambivalence. What does that mean? That means you're out to lunch spiritually. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, preachers. Right now, this is you. Okay, this is you. Oh, yeah, I'll go eat lunch here in about 35 minutes. And yeah, this is a sermon. Yeah, it's just another one of those sermons. Okay, whatever. And here's one anger. That is, how dare he say those things? He thinks he is so holy I'm not holy except in the blood of Jesus, but that's anger. You don't want to be held accountable. And here's one avoidance. What's that? Kicking the can down the road. Oh, I know I need, oh, oh, there's turmoil in my heart. I, I need to deal. God's dealing with me. I need to do business with God uh, later, later, later. And then there's apparent faith. Oh, yeah, I believe, but it's not really a heart commitment. And then finally, there's authentic faith. And praise God, that's when you say, oh, God, You've read my mail. You, you're speaking to me. This sermon was for me. This is a spiritual truth. Oh, God, move in my life. Forgive me. Save me. Whatever it may be. Restore me. Whatever it may be. But before I draw out the application of these words in Matthew 7, please allow me to give you the invitation on the front side of the message. So we're going to do it a little differently today. At the end, I'll walk down as normal. Musicians will come up as normal. Brother Travis lead us in the song as normal. But here's what I want you to do. If you were in the uh, new members class last week and you've not been presented and you're sure you want to join, I want you to come and just, there's plenty of room on all these front rows. And I'll tell you, Brother Travis will be up here. So there's, and his wife, she doesn't bite. I can tell you, I've been sitting there for several weeks. She's nice. And then Roger can, we can make him move if we need to. But there's plenty of room up here and just kind of space out. And others of you say, well, I need to talk to someone about joining. And you can either go back, you can tell the minister, look, I need to talk to someone about joining or about being saved or about rededication or baptism. Or you can say, hey, I just want to stay. Just say, look, I'm making a decision or I'm being presented and I want to stay up here. And we'll make an appointment later if we need to talk to you. But I want to talk to the whole group up here. So we're going to have one big happy family up here. And I'm praying that in this group of people. There are those, you know, you're saved. You've been scripturally baptized. You went to the new members class. God's leading you to join our church. You've decided to do it. And all we're going to do is say, hey, would you agree to covenant with us in church membership? Yes. And they'll applaud and you'll be accepted. All the way to someone who says, no, I'm not certain, pastor, if I'm really saved and I need to talk to someone or I want you to talk to me up here and then we'll make an appointment later. And then everything in between, rededication, baptism, whatever you need to do, you step out and come. I know that coming forward is kind of, that's a lot of people don't do that today. But I can remember when I was seven years old. 
and I'd talk to my parents about my deep conviction that I needed to be baptized. I kept telling them, I, I, I know I've been saved. Here's what happened. Here's what I prayed. Yes, Jesus is in my life. I, yes. And they said, well, you can walk forward. And, we, and my dad went with me. And uh, the pastor of Cherry Road Baptist Church here in Memphis was at that time the children's pastor at Broadway Baptist Church, Brother Tommy Marsh. He was standing right there at the front of an aisle of an auditorium, really about the size of this auditorium, which seat over a thousand people. And I walked down and I was crying and I was, I was somewhat frightened. I just turned seven just weeks before. But I want to tell you that it was so, it made it so real. I'll never, I can vaguely remember being baptized. I think I remember it mostly because I've watched the video. You ever have any memories like that? Oh, I remember that. Well, you really didn't, but you do now because you watched the video. But I want to tell you, there's no video of me walking forward, and I have never forgotten that. You say, well, is that in the New Testament? No, walking down a carpeted church aisle isn't, but publicly proclaiming your loyalty to Christ and letting the church know that you gladly have received the word is all through the book of Acts. So here we go, number one. Jesus does explain well for us. And he explains that the universal reaction will not result in a universal salvation. Now, when I first looked back at this, I was like, you know, is everyone going to say, Lord? I mean, certainly some people will know they're lost. You know, they'll know they're lost and they'll say, oh, no, you know, or, or maybe they'll still be defiant. We don't know. But look what verse 21 says. Very interesting. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Now, in verse 22, it says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, and he, he, he fills the blank in. But in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Here's what I believe. Everyone will say, Lord, Lord. How do you get that, Pastor? You're going to see the vision that John the Revelator saw, you're going to see the resurrected, glorified Jesus. I'm going to tell you, you may say, oh me, you may say, woe is me, you may say, I'm undone, you, you may say something, whatever, but I think you will say, Lord, Lord, you will recognize him. And Paul said in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow of those in heaven, on those earth, and, on, and of those under the earth. And they, with their tongues, will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friend, that atheist at your work is going to bow and say, Lord, Lord. Your college professor, young person, is going to say, Lord, Lord. And then we always, preachers love this because you can always plug in the latest villain. I mean, you could have plugged in Adolf Hitler or Mussolini or Mao Zedong or Lenin or Stalin. You come out, Saddam Hussein. I remember when I was growing up, it was Saddam Hussein is going to say, Lord. Then it was Osama bin Laden when my son was growing up. And then, you know, it just keeps changing. And, but, and we have our cultural villains too, don't we? And, you know, a few years ago, it was Lady Gaga. And, and 25 years ago, what, the preachers, Madonna's going to bow and say, Lord, Lord. I want to say Bill Maher, that smug atheist blasphemer that called God a psychopathic mass murderer, he's going to bow and say, Lord, no matter what generation we find ourselves in, no matter who the cultural villain or the socio-political villain is, I want to tell you from the smallest to the great, from the richest to the poor, no matter who you are, you will bow and call him Lord. The question is not if you will call him Lord, the question is when you will call him Lord. Let me ask you, will it be done in response to Christ's redemptive presence when through one of his servants here on earth he calls you to repentance and faith? Or will it be in response to the condemning, awful presence of God at what the Bible calls the white throne judgment? You see, there is a universal reaction. Everyone will bow the knee and will say, Lord, Lord. But there is no universal salvation. Look there at Matthew 7, 21. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It cannot be found any clearer in the Word of God that everyone, listen, everyone will not be saved. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Therefore, everyone will not be saved. Peter staked his life on it. He said, this is the cornerstone that you guys, you builders, rejected. You, you know, you're in your religion and you were looking for Messiah. Well, here he is and you reject him. He's become the absolute foundation of everything, the chief of the corner. And there's no one, other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the only way. Paul said it this way, I counted all things as dung that I might win Christ. He, he said, I threw it all away for Jesus. Why? He's the only way. The Bible teaches that there is no other name. There's no other way of salvation. Other religions will not be grafted into Christ's redeeming sacrifice on the cross. In fact, a very interesting passage, I won't turn to it, but Romans chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is explaining how everyone's guilty. Are you religious? You're guilty. Are you irreligious? You're guilty. Jew, Gentile, guilty, guilty. And he said, we're guilty even those without the law because by our very nature we do the things in the law. Now, you have to sort of understand the context because by our very nature we break the law. But what he's saying in there is there's a God-given conscience everyone has and we sort of judge ourselves. We know when we do something wrong and you've seen this even in absolute non-religious people. They know certain things are wrong and so there is going to be a judgment and not everyone will be in heaven. And the Bible simply teaches here and elsewhere that going to heaven will be neither the experience of all people nor the most popular place to which people have made travel plans. Because he said, many will say to me in that day, verse 22, Lord, Lord. And of course, the end is not good for them. Here's number two. So the first one is that Jesus explains to us that there's no universal salvation, but there is a universal cry, and this universal cry, this reaction, will not result in salvation for everybody. It will not. It's too late at that point. So here's the second one. Jesus, Jesus explains what a person does who knows him as Lord and Savior. Look with me in verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied or preached? In your name, does that mean you know him as Lord and Savior? Cast out demons in your name. Wow, that's got to mean you know him as Lord and Savior. No. And done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So the people who do the will of God... Verse 21, the people who are not lawless, verse 23, those are the ones that know him personally, and he knows them. 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6 says it this way, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Now, he's not saying you never sin, but he's saying your practice, your lifestyle, your character has been changed. And when someone looks at you, they see someone doing the will of of God. Abide means that you, you don't just believe something in your head, you are resting, trusting in them. John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, Jesus said, it is he who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now we don't have time to go back into Matthew chapters five and six, but the Sermon on the Mount really is the gold standard for how different people, holy people, 
people who've been changed on the inside, people who've been forgiven of their sins, people who have the Holy Spirit of God, people who belong to Jesus live. And I'm just going to give you some categories here very quickly. His will on our attitudes towards self and others, the Beatitudes. Remember, blessed are, fill in the blank. His will for our hearts, you know, blessed are the pure in heart. His will for marriage, he talks about marriage in the sermon. His will for living in the midst of persecution, you know, they're going to say all manner of evil against you, but you're going to, and you're going to be persecuted, but blessed are you when, you'll, when you are reviled for my name's sake. How to find and be in his will through prayer and fasting. When you fast, he said, here's the way the, the, the Lord's prayer. Here's the way to pray. And then seek his will, his will even for material wealth, Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus explains what a person does who knows him as Lord and Savior. If you ever want to look in the mirror, and by the way, James says that the Bible is the perfect law of liberty. The mirror that we should look in to examine ourselves is the Word of God. But if you ever want to look into the mirror and see who you are, study the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I'm not saying you're going to say, oh, yeah, I fit the bill, I'm, I'm saved. There are varying degrees, not of being saved, but of being sanctified. And we'll always find something where we're failing in, but the difference is going to be you're going to see that there's a different way you operate than you did before you were saved. And that's the, the point here. So Jesus explains that the universal reaction will not result in a universal salvation. He explains what a person does who, do, who, in fact, knows him personally as Lord and Savior. And here's number three. Jesus explains that neither service nor association necessarily equals salvation. Now, we've already read that. Lord, we preached in your name, cast out demons in your name. Surely, that, surely you have to be saved if you can cast out a demon. But, you know, there were some exorcists there in Acts, and they were, I don't, you could say, well, they were fraudsters. I, I, I don't know. I know they, they noticed that the power of God was greater than their power, but they were not saved. And then in Revelation 13, did you know the Bible teaches that Satan, the great dragon, will give the beast power that he can call down fire from heaven, and it says, to deceive Many. The Bible says, Paul said actually in 2 Corinthians that the devil is disguised as an angel of light. In other words, there will be those who both do the most religious things and, and, and even the most um, impressive religious things, and they associate themselves with Jesus and the church but they will hear the Lord banish them. And by the way, look back at verse 23. And then I will declare to them, scholars tell us this next phrase is an old rabbinical official banishment. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. By the way, the title of the message today is Shock and Awful. Can you imagine the shock? And can you imagine how awful? Here's the last one today. I'm going to be brief today. Number four, Jesus explains who the lost are. People he doesn't know, I never knew you. And see, in John 17, 3, he said, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. In, in John 2, 24, Jesus did some miracles, and it says, many believed. But it says Jesus did not commit himself to them, and it's the word believe. It's the word faith. Jesus did not faith them. Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men, and there the word know is not know in a personal way, but know their heart. We can't know someone else's heart, but Jesus does know everyone's heart. And the lost are people he doesn't know personally. And secondly, people whose lives have never changed. He said, you who practice lawlessness. 
What that means is not that they were without the law, but here's what one scholar said, a lax attitude about the will of God. That's why Paul said, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have, be ha uh, have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's why he said to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 6, that be not deceived, God is not mocked. He said, know ye not that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he gives a long list and then he says, and such were some of you, but you've been washed, you've been cleansed, you've been set apart by the blood of Jesus and the spirit of God. You've been changed. Here's what Paul said of himself, Acts 26, 9, almost towards the very end. Paul's giving his testimony and here's what he says. Indeed, I myself thought, past tense, I thought I must do many things contrary to, to the Jesus, to the name of Jesus, excuse me, of Nazareth. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So many say, well, I, but I believe, I believe. And many will say, everyone's going to say, Lord, Lord, we're, we're going to be overwhelmed. But Jesus said, many will say, Lord, I, I did, I, 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 I believed, I did things for you. I Look what I did. I don't know you. Never did. Leave. You do what you want to do in your life. You know, there's really the commentary of a lost person. They might be moral. They might have some good ethics. But even those work out better to their end on earth than being crooked oftentimes. They've got impure motives for that. That's really a definition of law. I do what I want. I am my own boss. Listen to what John Wesley said. And I don't know if we have this for you, but John Wesley, uh, great, great preacher of the gospel and um, unintended father of the Methodist movement. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is a child of God, 1 John 5.1. The faith assumed here by the apostles is not a merely speculative idea, nor is it bare assent to the proposition that Jesus is the Christ or to the various propositions contained in our creed, nor to the propositions contained in the Old and New Testament. Boys and girls, propositions are statements of fact, okay? It is not merely an intellectual assent or a, a, a nod of yes, to any or all of these affirmations so as to consent abstractly to their credibility. That is, you agree with them in your mind in theory. For remember that even the devils have faith like that and it makes them tremble, James 2.19. Wesley went on to say this, this would be tantamount to saying unthinkably that the devils also are born again, since it can be argued that the trembling demons assented not only to the ideas that Jesus is the Christ, but also to the notion that all divinely inspired scriptures are true. The demons heard Jesus speak and also knew that he bore faithful witness as they had beheld the testimony he gave of himself and and the Father and saw the mighty works he did, they could not help assenting that he had come from God. Yet despite this assent or intellectual belief, they are still consigned, quote, to the dark pits of hell where they are reserved for judgment, 2 Peter 2, 4. I'm finished. But let's just read the scripture one more time. But before we do that, I want to give you Three key passages to understanding this sermon. Not my sermon, but Jesus' sermon on the mount. First verse, Matthew 5, 48. Just, just turn over two pages. It's not hard. Last verse, chapter 5. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. He's saying, look, there is a holiness of God that completes you. And he is the standard, not these other standards. Then the second one is, is chapter 6, verse 8. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. He's talking about them, and who is them? Them are the Pharisees and scribes that are religious but don't know God. And then here's the last. These are actually two verses. Chapter 7, 
verses 28 and 29. Flip over there just below our passage. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now let me just synthesize those three passages of Scripture. Two, actually four verses total. God is the standard. It's perfection. The Sermon on the Mount shows us what that looks like coming through a life. And then our righteousness has got to exceed and be different than the people who say this is righteous, which are religious people that don't know God. And then finally, they understood this is real. This is authoritatively from God. He's not just trying to teach and lord over us like those other religious people. We, this is absolutely binding on our lives, and we need to pay attention. So with that in mind... Let me reread our passage and we'll close. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does, poion, present tense participle, it means the continual action of your life is that you're doing the will of God. This is a practice in your life. It's something regular. Who does the will of my Father in heaven? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice, different word for work or do, lawlessness. But it means that's the practice of your life. Shock and awful. But you know what's wonderful? God says, I'm not suffering. I, I'm not long suffering, or I am long suffering towards you. I'm not slack concerning my promise. I'm long suffering. I'm willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Here's another thing that's so clear in the Bible, and I don't know why so many people miss it. God really does want everyone to be saved. Now, everyone's not going to be saved, but if you're not saved, it won't be because God said, no, I don't want you. I just hadn't picked you. It will be because you never knew him. You never came into a relationship with him. You never allowed him to change your life. You never were truly, as, John, as Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, born again or born from above. Pastor, how do I, I do that? I want to be born again. I want to be sure. I'm not sure. Are you willing to absolutely as best you know how? And here's what I mean by that. There are always portions of our lives that God begins to point out a year after we're saved. Does everyone remember about a year after you're saved? Now, let me ask you this. What about 20 years after you're saved? God's still working. Anyone's God's still working on you? How many have been saved 20 years? How many have been saved 30 years? All right. Yeah, me too. So, in a sense, you'll always be growing in Christ. But here's the deal. Don't say, oh yeah, I just don't want to go to hell, but I'm, I am going to still call my own shots. Why don't you say, Jesus, I don't even know my own heart, but I do believe with all my heart that you died for my sin and rose from the grave. And I know I can't save myself. And I like what I heard Erwin Lutzer say the other day. He prefers this to asking Jesus into your heart. Lord, I transfer my trust from whatever I was trusting in, baptism, church membership, or maybe nothing at all, or maybe being a good, or maybe, you know, like someone said, well, I'm not that bad of a person. Can you hear that one? Lord, Lord, not I preached in your name. I was a pastor or cast out demons. Lord, Lord, I wasn't that bad of a person. Can you hear that one? Ridiculous. Lord, Right now, I bow the knee this side of eternity. 
And I need your grace. For the wages of sin is death. That's what I deserve, Lord. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I understand Jesus paid for my sin. And I want to ask him to save me. Just pray that right now. Instrumentalists are going to come. We're going to begin our invitation after I pray. And uh, you step out and come. Remember, if you're going to be presented, you come. If you're going to... If you're going to uh, need to talk with someone or maybe talk with someone later and just sit up here. You come, just tell the minister why you're coming. But here's the deal. Don't be shocked and in all that awful state on that day. Please, please, no, everyone won't be saved. Yes, you will say, Lord, Lord. Yes, your knee will bow. Your tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But here's the thing. You want it to count for eternity. And we're saved by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Pastor, I thought you just read that the person that knows God does his will. Yeah, but that's what happens after you're given the free gift. You begin to change. God's doing that. You're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. You, you see, it's not faith plus do some works, but it's faith and then there's a supernatural change and then God begins to work in you. And so you know him. And you don't say, oh, I better do good because I don't want to go to hell. You say, oh, Lord, I, I want to do what you want me to do. Because I know you, and you want the best for me. Teaches that in Matthew 5 through 7. Lord, you, have, you know what I need of before I even ask. L Lord, you've forgiven me. I need to forgive someone else. Lord, I've got something that I can never lose. Lord, I know you. I want to live for you. That's it. Let's stand as I pray. Lord, would you move in this place? May we respond to you now by saying, Lord, Lord. It from the depths of our heart. In Jesus' name we pray.